What is up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Knife Nuts Podcast, the show that brings you the best and worst that the knife community has to offer. And in case you couldn't tell from my overzealous intro, joining us tonight is the one and only Ben Peterson from Blade HQ. What is up, guys? I, I, you did that great. That was a beautiful intro. Couldn't have oh, done well, it thank better, you. better myself. That's something I've <laughs> wanted to do since I started this podcast. You have no idea. Yes, I love it. We don't really have a shtick yet, like a, like a line that we could repeat, you know? So yeah, no. we, we need you know, one the, of these. Those things come with time. You, you can't just, you can't force that stuff. I'm trying to do like a little spiel, the same thing every time, but it's kind of terrible. I'm working on it. Yeah, we, we we really we need more shticks. We're not sticky enough at this point. You, you can you can borrow mine in the meantime. Oh, no I will. <laughs> we'll put that. We'll put the copyright info in the description. Actually, last I heard, Perfect. we have a collaboration with Cold Steel and Gallagher coming out where we use some of their warhammers to smash watermelons, and that's our new shtick. Oh wow! Oh that's yeah. Not bad. Well, anyway, we want to be respectful of of Ben's time. Thank you again for joining us, Ben. We really appreciate it. You bet. Thanks, thanks for the invitation. I, I appreciate it. So what we're going to do is we need to know how you got the best job in the world. Good question. So it's kind of random. I I was uh, about to graduate from college and I'd studied broadcast journalism and film. And uh, I'm sitting there going, I don't really want to be in either of those industries. So what could I do instead? And uh, I was at a family party chatting with like my wife's cousin's husband so it was like an extended family party and he's like yeah I, I sell knives on the internet and i'm like uh like kitchen knives or what he's like no more like pocket knives and i was like well do you run any video on your website and he's like no but we want to and that was kind of the the start of getting into it I, mm. I it wasn't like i went out and searched for pocket knives and wanted to work in this industry the industry kind of found me yeah, so does? i started <laughs> here yeah i started here at blade hq in 2011 and uh, I was only doing YouTube at the time and did that for about three years. And then I moved up to CRKT for about three years. And then, yeah, twists and turns with life. And uh, I was planning to go back to school and Blade HQ called and said, hey, do you want to be the marketing manager at Blade HQ? And I said, well, maybe. We worked it out and uh, came back to Blade HQ for a second round. So I've been here about a year at this point. So that's kind of my backstory. Yeah. I, I, I think a lot of people in this industry, the industry finds them. They don't necessarily go out and say, I want to sell knives for a living. Totally. And uh, so I'm a knife guy because of my, my profession. Like, I think they're awesome. I think they're cool. But I think a lot of knife guys, it finds them and they become part of it. Whereas it found me and I became like in the industry. So Well, it's interesting because you were one of the first faces of the knife community for a lot of people, myself included. Yep. Like when we, as we start going I'm, through, I'm YouTube, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's it's not a bad face, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank but you. when we're going through YouTube and stuff like that, there's one. No matter what type of the knife, what part of the knife industry you're in, everybody knows who Blade HQ is, and they associate you are the face of Blade HQ. You know, so we really, yeah. we really, uh, you know, appreciate all the work you've done for for the industry. Hey, I, I appreciate everybody shopping with us. I mean, it's to me like going to Blade Show and meeting the people that shop with us is one of the coolest things because you work in an online retailer, you don't see people, you don't know who's shopping with you. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, you see their order come through and what they buy, but uh, yeah, it's, it's cool to put faces with with the names and stuff. So I appreciate you guys watching and and shopping with us. It's it's cool to virtually meet you guys. Awesome. And we're going to have a lot of questions for you as, as we progress, Hit but me. there is one thing that we need to know, and this goes to all the guys. What have you guys been carrying for the past week or two? Ben, go first. Do you want me to? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. So I, um, Benchmade came out, they just discontinued their sequel uh, mm. model this year, and they came out with this sequel with aluminum handles, blue aluminum handles. And I'm such a sucker for blue aluminum handles. Uh, it's S30V, and I couldn't resist. It was a, a SHOT Show special, and I think I picked it up for like 50 bucks. So wow. I couldn't resist. So I've been carrying that for probably three or four months. I'm trying to get like that patina look on the aluminum handles. Like a like a worn look? Yeah. Uh-huh. 
That's going to look cool. I I am no Mm Benchmade fan, but I really love that specific one that you have. I think the sequel is one of their nicest looking designs, but... uh, The sequel is an awesome knife. So it goes with Benchmade. Yes. Axis lock, man. I I can't get over the axis lock. I'm smitten with it. Truly. You've you've always been a proprietor of the uh, the 940. I know that. Yeah. Do you know what's funny? So we made that video where I bought the 940. Mm -hmm. I carried the 940 for about a month. And I realized, so, so that was my first, I'm not even going to call it a big knife. It's not a big knife. It's mm-hmm. more of a medium-sized knife, but over three-inch blade. And I realized I just don't like an over three-inch blade. I like under three inches. So I sold it. I flipped it. Boo. Oh, how about that? I think most I of us have owned a 940 at this point. Jake, I know my mm-hmm. first experience with it was yours. You had the 940. I was enamored with the pink backspacer. Like, yeah. I needed that pink backspacer in my life. <laughs> they, they they knew how to do contrast on that one. With they the certainly green. did the watermelon colored knife. Yeah, exactly. I, it was amazing. And then it prompted me to buy a gold class version. The gold, class, I know you yeah. you had to one up me with the gold class and uh, with the and weird, did. the weird like turquoise colored titanium handles. And M4 steel. That was my first time experiencing M4 steel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was actually pretty nice. Uh, I've I have had one 940 for about three days. Um, and then it was in a trade, and I immediately traded away. But the newer ones are actually kind of appealing to me, like the 940-2 oh, yeah. with the G10 yeah, yeah, scale. Yeah, that's awesome. And the yeah. very Chris Reeve front chamfer on the scale, which is a really subtle detail, but for some reason I really like that chamfer on the front of the scale on the G10 ones. Um, I don't want to plug any other retailers when we're on here, but there is another person who has one with a C-Tech inlay that is really cool. You know, Yeah, from, from Going Gear. I'll plug him. Oh, is awesome. I was going to say, no free promotion on this podcast, but there we go. You said it anyway, so it's at Going Gear. <laughs> Marshall's the man, man. I, I really like Marshall. And, you know, this industry is small enough that, I mean, I'm not going to tell you to go shop at Going Gear, but if you end up there... <laughs> If you end up there, not only a bit, buy not, that not 940. A it could be worse. Yeah, only buy that <laughs> 940. <laughs> You're not allowed to buy no, anything I, else. In fact, I, I sat down and just chatted. I always chat with Marshall. I've chatted with him for years now at shows. And, uh, yeah, I was just chatting with him the other day at Blade Show. He's a great guy. Love Marshall. Good guy. He always seems like a pretty good dude, yeah. He does, like, yeah. some uh, really in-depth YouTube videos. You know what? He he does a really great job with that. I would I might say he's second only to someone else on this podcast. No, do you know, do you know what? I, I will freely admit, like, I watched Marshall's videos when I first started doing this, because he, he did a great job. And um, so back in the day, I used to watch his flashlight videos and just kind of, like, digest what he was doing. Um, he's a smart guy. I like him a lot. Cool. Well, we're really enjoying what you're doing with the knife banter videos. We we, we aspire to that only on a, only in an R-rated sense. <laughs> <laughs> I think our production values will always remain a little bit more DIY. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Uh, Jake, what have you been carrying? Well, that uh, that Hap Forty, the new Spider Co, um, is still getting a lot of pocket time. Although Two today, uh, just just for Dave, I did switch to Alliance Steel, the uh, the Lizard Damascus tie spine. This is great segue. Uh, not to interrupt <laughs> you, but I recently found out I had Alliance Steel on pre order that I didn't remember pre ordering. So <laughs> your boy is going to be you the are proud the worst. Owner. Your boy is going to be the proud owner of. Uh, one of the collector's knives exclusive uh, line steel Euro Barlows, which is a, a little slip uh, yeah. in the Barlow style, but with like uh-huh. titanium bolsters. And I got the carbon fiber scales with an M390 blade. Uh, what was it you said about the line steel that failed the lock? If the lock failed in that advanced knife bro video, what is it you said about that? Uh, I think it, I mentioned that it made me aroused sexually. <laughs> when it did. So we'll see how I feel about this knife when I get it. But apparently I'm going to be the proud owner of a Lion Steel I didn't particularly want anymore. <laughs> God. You are the biggest hypocrite on the face of the I forgot I pre-ordered earth. this. <laughs> it's also, a company that he, he loathes but still spends money with them this is constantly. Pre- Admittedly, I put in this pre-order pre-blade, so we'll see. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm excited to hate it, but if it's not bad, I will also be pretty excited because it's a really cool modern slip joint. Are you, are you saying that you're going to be able to remain objective even, uh, even after all of your uh, all the hate? Hate. hate. Lots of hate. The real genuine hate. I mean, mm-hmm. I'll still make fun of them, but if it's good, I'll say it's good. I'm not going to take I'm, I'm not going to take back any of the M&M slander. I'm going <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh-oh. Fine. What are you carrying? What I what did I carry today? 
the Booze Blades Smoke TS1, oh, yeah. the new front flipper made by Ween Eyes for, w- is it William Booze? I don't know. I think his name is William. Anyway, he, he has a little company. He has knives designed for him and makes them. It's a front flipper. It's a really tiny little knife. I mean, I guess it's not tiny. It's a three and a half inch blade, but it's very slender in every other dimension. It's really cool. There's some really incredible like details, like the sort of triangular pivot on the um, presentation side. It's just really cool looking. It's a front flipper. It flips really well as a hidden hardware 3D pocket clip that works really well. I like it. The only thing I will say is mine came dull and a bunch of other people's came dull. And mine has like a weird stray tooling mark where the plunge grind is. So like, I guess maybe that's why it was $200 because that seems like a really good deal otherwise. So Mm. maybe the quality control was a little iffy just because there was only a hundred of them. So, you know, if a couple were dull, that's a little strange. Uh, But anyway, I really like it. I think it's a really cool knife. And I also got my reground Nirvana back from Josh at Razor Edge Knives. And oh, yeah. You were talking about that. Oh, it's so cool. It's so cool. It's a 60 grit regrind, so it's very, very, very coarse. Like, it catches your finger when you run it across it. But So you bought that from Blade HQ, and you were going to send it back for... You were trying to try and return it, right? No, that is that will lead into a question later um, <laughs> about, about how you guys feel about returns and pickiness. I do have some some questions in that but no I'm sure you do it is uh I, it is definitely a keeper now i've put too much money into it um i'll just that's, wait until that's the, that's yeah i'll just wait until the lock eventually fails and spider co refuses to service Crazy. it so oh god <laughs> yes and, and believe it or not i'll have some opinions on that too no <laughs> yes yeah, so that would be that'd be nice to get the both sides of the coin there but so yeah. brian what have you yeah. been up to you've been carrying any knives lately no Yes, but just in pieces. You know, <laughs> I only carry them pieces at a time. <laughs> I'm just knee deep in getting these mini typhoons going. That's great. I mean, what are we are now knee deep into uh, the second run? Yes. Very cool. How's the heat? Did you get the heat treat stuff back from the drop points or no? Nope, they're there now. They should be a couple more days before they start heading back. Is that with Paul Bowes? Yep. Okay. Cool. Mm. Yeah, just trying to give them a shot. I have been carrying two knives over the past week and a half. Uh, the first one I want to mention is uh, I did end up choosing the carbon fiber uh, Liang Ma kitchen utility knife. Uh, it's just something about it in person just stuck out to me more than the than the my Carta version. <laughs> yeah, so, but, something about it. Yeah, well. Well, the, the truth is that the micarta version was a little off center, but that wasn't that wasn't the deciding factor. I just felt like I like micarta to have like a texture, you know, like a physical texture, not just a visual one. And this one just was kind of smooth. And I like the integrated backspacer and the contrasting hardware, so I I kept the the carbon fiber one. Uh, awesome knife. Um, talk about blade to handle ratio. Yeah, that thing. Holy crap! Awesome knife. The second thing I'm carrying is a knife by uh, a gentleman by the name of Spencer Cox. Everybody laugh now. His la- his <laughs> Cox Workshop is the name of, 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 of the company, and it's a custom knife that is mostly CNC. I think all CNC. Um, the, the, the knife is actually called the Riscate. I think I'm saying that right. It's a strange name. It's probably one of my only criticisms about the knife because the thing is amazing. Um, it's a Spanish word meaning rescue. Well, thank you for that. Well, that was yeah, that, that was, easy. <laughs> that was yeah. wow. And I was just about to say it means penis in Spanish, but <laughs> that joke is ruined. Well, it means rescue in Spanish. That's why we've been here all the time. You're invited to stay for every episode from here on. Perfect. Out I will translate all the weird names into meaningful, meaningful words. <laughs> well, it's called. It's a fantastic knife. Um, we were talking a little bit before we started that, uh, from a design perspective, it looks like really handle heavy, but in person, it's it actually works really, really well in hand. Great, I could see it work more as a as a rescue knife, very, very well. Um, fantastic details, no hard edges, and he sells these things for four hundred bucks. Honestly, if you got if Blade HQ is shopping, I wouldn't be surprised if you guys picked up a few of them because they're very well made he's very easy to deal with they come in these leather pouches all wrapped up very very cool stuff i'm very impressed with this relatively new maker and that's cox workshop so i really enjoyed that cox workshop did he did he just get the knife nuts bump do we have a bump 
Is that a thing well, we do he got he, he got the first official knife nuts bump. Oh, okay. We have a bump now. Cool. Let's see. Let's see. We have a bump. Let's see if it sinks as many makers as the skeleton bump. Uh, hey, I've seen the skeleton bump do some good for some people. <laughs> no <Maybe>. comment. <laughs> anyway, um, let's see. Where can we go from here? Do, do you want to start getting into some questions? Yeah, sure. Why not? So you want to start with some of our oh. questions because we're more important than our listeners. Just kidding. We love you Absolutely. guys. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, you know what? That, that, let's get to that question I asked before. Um, so, Ben, and then Brian, you could chime in on this. Yeah. So you guys sell to knife enthusiasts and not really... You know, Blade HQ is definitely a, a pretty specialized store. You don't sell, like, $20 Gerbers to people. You have a whole range. And, you know, when people get more and more into a hobby, they can get more persnickety about minor details. So Persnickety. <laughs> That's the $10 word. Um, what do you think is an acceptable level of pickiness? Because I imagine you guys get a lot of returns from people who are being ridiculously obsessive about certain details. But then also, you know, sometimes people have legitimate complaints because sometimes, you know, the companies don't necessarily catch up with what the enthusiasts want or expect in terms of fit and finish. So for you, from your experience at Blade HQ, what do you think is a reasonable uh, amount of pickiness that you, you should be when buying a knife, a, a production knife, let's say, from, you know, Blade HQ? Uh, that's, that's a really good question. And I, I think you got to look at it from a brand perspective. you got to look at it from a, how much did you pay for this knife? I, I think if you're buying a, a $30 Tenacious, you can't be persnickety. I mean, I, I think to a point you can. Obviously, the QC has to be there, but you get what you pay for. And so, no, the G10 is not going to be perfect um, on the liners. It's, you just you don't get that in a thirty dollars knife. But if you're buying a Sabenza, you better darn well have really great fit and finish. The blade centering cannot be off. Um, so I look at it from that perspective, like and. The thing that's funny is you'll, you'll get some somebody who buys like a, a $20 knife and then they're all sorts of bend out of shape because it's not a perfect sample of that particular knife. And it's like, well, you only paid 20 bucks and the scale is different for everybody. You guys are talking about buying $400 knives. If you're paying for a $400 knife, it better darn well be great. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're paying for a $25 knife, you get what you pay for. So that's, that's kind of my short answer to the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, I feel bad when, uh, you know, because I think people generally have a good expectation when you've been collecting knives enough. But one thing that I've noticed is uh, when, like, for example, Boker Plus, who, you know, have a, a spotty history with Fit and Finish, when they'll do a collaboration with a really hot custom maker, and then you'll start getting people who are used to buying multiple thousand dollar knives, buying cheap production knives, and getting upset about that. I feel like that probably gets burdensome at some point. <laughs> But, you know, that's a very specific thing. It does. But, you know, you know, one example of that, that uh, I think it happened a couple of years ago, and it, it's an ongoing thing, but anytime a, a custom maker sends a, a custom knife to a production company, it's not going to be as high as their custom. So I remember when the Burnley Quaken came out from Boker, mm -hmm. um, I believe it was a carbon fiber version, and there was kind of some chips in the carbon fiber, fit and finish wasn't great. And... Lucas actually, it's, it's interesting to see this process from the inside because Lucas actually went to Boker and said, hey, guys, this isn't working for me. Like, if my name's going to be on it, we got to we gotta increase the quality control here. And I think Boker's actually made some good strides when it comes to that. And it's not going to be perfect. It's a production knife. It's coming off a line. But uh, it's, it's interesting to be on the back end and see these, these custom makers. I've seen Ken Onion do the same thing, where he, his expectation of quality with his customs is so high and it, he knows it's not going to be perfect but he takes some of that to the production companies he works with and i think it it's kind of a rising tide raises all boats in the harbor i think those custom makers are increasing the quality of lower end knives in the industry too by simply saying look this has my name on it make it good yeah i mean it's a fantastic thing and I'm sure when you yep. were at C CRKT, you got a lot of that. But, you know, let's talk about Blade HQ. Let's talk about the present. <laughs> well, I have, I have to say that, you know, it's funny that Dave, of all people, asked this question because he is literally the most persnickety human being am, I've ever met in my I am entire life. I definitely not. No. No way. Can, what's you know, the general consensus here? I resent persnickety. that. Persnickety. 
plus, uh, plus one here. <laughs> Absolutely. I resent that. <laughs> you resemble that. <laughs> Fine. You wear it well, dude. All right. It's true. It's part of his shtick. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, go go ahead, Lana. Well, I was going to say um, is, you know, we, we just talked about, uh, you know, seeing the, the Burnley Quakens come off the line. And a lot of us are curious about how much industry insight that you have. You know, Epic Snuggle Bunny actually posted this on my Instagram and, and something that's been on my mind, too. So how, how early do you guys get to see prototypes? How early do they, uh, you know, do you guys put in orders for knives? Um, and how do you know how many to buy? And what sells best and why? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. To, to answer the first question, when do we know? It, it kind of depends. Uh, when we go to SHOT Show, typically first time we've ever seen stuff. We might get things a week early uh, from the manufacturer, but most of the time we're kind of going into it blind. And in fact, if, if any manufacturers listen to this podcast, I, I wish they would give us more no- notification. Like, um, Simply because a lot of people come to us for information. We're finding out a lot of times the same time as the consumer because they're doing an announcement. Um, so I wish that were a little bit different. Now, there are times, for instance, the Benchmade bug out just came out oh, two weeks ago. Um, we saw that one. We saw a prototype of that one probably six months ago. Um, Benchmade was in town, and they just happened to have one on them and kind of passed it around the room one day. It happen very often. It's We kind of see it when consumers see it. Um, to answer your next question that was about how many to order and that sort of thing, Man, that's alchemy. It's uh, it's fascinating because um, some stuff just takes off and goes crazy, and other stuff it's like, oh, well, that didn't didn't do as well as we thought. Um, but you can kind of judge it off of past experience with the brand. Um, I know, yeah, a couple of easy examples from this year: the uh, CRKT thirty-five dollar model. Nobody predicted that thing was going to sell like it has, and it's been one of the best sellers of the year. Um, and that happens fairly frequently but the cool thing is you, you get other models like the uh, the Kershaw launch when that thing came out we knew it was going to be hot and it's it's been super hot since it since it hit the shelves and you can kind of just predict when a new model is going to blow up so there were a couple other questions in there did I answer all of them yeah absolutely I mean they were all tied together I think you you okay. you, you, you nailed them you know th- it all ties together uh, from uh, a, it's weird seeing again we're seeing it from kind of the inside out sort of thing now um and looking at trends and trying to predict them is that something that you guys are looking at all the time do you guys look at that stuff or you just say hey these are cool we're going to keep them we're going to sell them whether they sell or not hey you know that's great oh absolutely we're we're totally looking at trends and it's it's partially terrifying too for example we've got Five Spyderco exclusives that have been in the works for six months already, and they're not going to show up for another six months. And do so we already know about them, or can you talk about them right now? I, I'm sure I can't something. talk about them yet. They're, they're oh. exciting, though. Mm. Be excited. Be excited. <laughs> We're excited. Um, but it's it's interesting because you're you're kind of betting on a trend a year out, or you're betting that you can create a trend a year out, and that's a uh, kind of a scary place to be when you've got to do like a 2,500 piece minimum sure. and exclusive. Um, and sometimes they do great. Other times it's like, Oh, that, that did not do well. And we got to pivot and, and make it work. So. Hmm. It's interesting because, you know, I can pose the same question to collectors and we've actually gotten this question a few times on our, on, on my Instagram about how do you pick what custom knives to buy? Cause you guys do, everything uh through the production realm but you guys also you know are a great place to go and look at what new new up-and-coming makers are there what established makers you know you guys carry the whole kit and caboodle and for us yeah you know as as collectors we're always looking for for new stuff like i was i'm carrying that that riscate folder right now and that's a new maker so it it's do you pick stuff that you just like and which is kind of like how I roll. I don't know how everybody does that, but I assume there's a little more to it from from a company standpoint. Yeah, it's that's a that's a hard game to play and so we've got a couple buyers our, our custom buyer's name is Timote and um, 
I think the best way to describe him is he's kind of a style hound. He uh, mm. he collects sneakers. <laughs> he uh, he kind of just has his ear to the ground as far as what's trendy, what's cool. He uh, spends a lot of time on Instagram. Um, but it's, I mean, every time you buy a custom knife, unless it's a, an established maker, there's a risk involved in that. And I think I, I'm on the marketing side, and I don't know that we do a great job marketing the, the custom knives as well as we could. It's a hard game to play because it's onesie twosies rather than yeah. It's not a it's not a money maker, so to speak. You know, I mean, right. and truthfully, I mean, Blade HQ in general is a very successful company. You know, I it's it's amazing to look at the numbers that they do. Are they in the Fortune 500? I think you guys are. Are you not? I don't think so, and I I think most play anyway. Yeah, so well, yeah, you send in your send in your data and three hundred bucks, and you can make the Fortune 500. <laughs> Seriously, uh, if not, you're pretty darn close. It's it's an amazing story, and I, I was just I was doing some small research of how it was done. It was started by a knife enthusiast, right? Yeah, so so it's actually a, kind of an interesting story. Our our history is we started as a software company, um, and one of our one of the founders was selling knives on eBay back in like 2002, 2003. So kind of early e-commerce days. Mm -hmm. And um, so he was just kind of doing that on the side. And then his buddy was trying to start an e-commerce platform. And so he, they just kind of randomly threw up knives on the internet to test the e-commerce platform. They actually licensed that out for quite a few years and uh, eventually realized that there's more money. Oh, yeah. There's more money in the niche of knives than trying to compete with, with big e-commerce platforms. So they kicked everybody else off the platform and they just use it for Blade HQ now. So... It's it's kind of rooted in software development. Uh, we run our own platform, and it's uh, it's interesting and fun. So we we run kind of we're we're probably a cross between a tech company and a retailer when you get right down to it. Which is funny because I, I actually work for a, a a small computer company named after a fruit, and uh, I see a lot of this stuff. I see a lot of companies try and start out the Blade HQ website is a model of perfection it is amazing like going on there and searching for you can search pm2 and it knows what you're talking about it's crazy you can go by color <laughs> everything is just on it and honestly a lot of the questions i've been getting on my on my instagram hover around the website it's like what's happening there why is it like that how do i do that what's happening there and it's a proprietary software. It literally is the core of Blade HQ. Yeah, and it's it's funny. Um, it's it's the best and the worst of both worlds as far as having a proprietary software. You, you build a lot of stuff from scratch. We've got, oh, what, three developers working on it full time. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we want a new feature, we have to be really serious and deliberate about it. You can't just say, hey, I want this and plug and play. So everything we build is very well thought out and and deliberate so that shows I, that is one of the cool that's honestly one of the reasons uh we wanted to have you on the show is because you really do you guys do push the boundaries of of what what this industry and what this community is capable of and i think that's really cool a huge voice for Thank you. everything here yeah you guys uh, were uh, among the first re i mean were definitely the first retailer to really do more community engagement in the sense of making videos and inviting the fans to participate in videos which I, you probably have noticed that a few other companies have sort of latched on to that model so what kind of inspired you guys to do that because i'm sure blade hq was selling plenty of knives you know without all of the cool stuff with the i remember you guys had like a griptilian test you used to have like 20 minute long like testing videos and you know stuff that other retailers weren't doing and that blade hq probably didn't need to do but you know i think everyone is really thankful for so what kind of sparked that um so for me personally, I when I got here, we were kind of running, I want to call it batch and blast. You basically just line something up and throw it out there and, and hope people respond. And as I got deeper into the YouTube scene, I realized like there was a community there. I remember having conversations with uh, Gavco in the comments on YouTube. And I realized like, this isn't Nike. This is not... Mm -hmm a big corporation it's not a huge industry as far as industries go <clears throat> and 
So for me personally on YouTube, I just said, look, I don't know how to do anything but authenticity. And so I'm just going to be authentic with, with people. I, I think the first six months we kind of tried to, the first six months I was here, we tried to just kind of be this corporate monolith. And for some reason, that corporate monolith method just didn't work. And so I said, okay, how can we revamp this? And uh, I, I think you, you referenced, we did a collaboration video with uh, Crockett20 on YouTube. This was years ago, probably five years ago. Mm. Uh, with the mini griptilian yep. and that was the first time i realized like okay if i can focus on community and I, if i can focus on actually caring about these people like customers people will respond and you know they do we we walk around blade show and talk to people and like man i love this piece of content you made or i made i love this video or this instagram post and i think we we figured out how to talk to people in a meaningful way. And at the end of the day, I think that comes from being knife nuts ourselves. Like I was not a knife nut when I started, but dang, I, we talk knives all day long. Like the whole office does up here in marketing and downstairs and customer service, everybody's talking knives. And I think like, caring about the product that you sell. And I think one of the, one of the advantages people can copy what we do just a business. Everybody here carries a knife from the CEO to the, the people in order fulfillment packing packages. We're a bunch of knife nuts. So it's hard to replicate that. And I, I've watched kind of our competitors copy a few things here and there. And they're good at business. They're smart folks. But uh, it's hard to replicate passion. It's, it's interesting because, you know, transparency is a big part of running a successful company. Um, sure. And being a really large company, I mean, relatively speaking, you know, a, a, a large company approaching their customers as a small company is is set up for success but do you find that it's getting more and more difficult or easier as time is going on as the industry is arguably getting larger there's a lot more people a lot more makers a lot more manufacturers do you find it uh easier to maintain that connection with with the customers or harder i think it's getting harder than ever for me personally at least i um i find that I spend a lot of my time kind of focused on our top 10, top 20, 30 brands. And that's kind of a hard spot to be because that's, that's how we keep the lights on. Right. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of peripheral stuff happening in the industry. I mean, I think you talking about Cox workshop, I've never heard of them, mm -hmm. um, but there's just been such an influx of custom makers and mid tech and, who is, who is this rising maker that I've never heard of? And it's, it's hard. I'll, I'll be perfectly honest. It's hard to stay on top of stuff. And, um, yeah, it, there's just a lot of, it, it's a it's weird, kind food of, chain. I would say it's kind of a renaissance. <laughs> it is. It's, and it's kind of a renaissance in the knife industry. Generally, you've got these Chinese companies that are cranking out amazing, uh, products as far as you've got Lee, Riati, Kaiser. Um, these are folks that three, four years ago, you'd never even heard of them. And now mm -hmm. they're hitting our top 20, top, top 10 brands. And it's like, whoa, you know, they, they hit the radar and hit it hard. So it's, I think it's becoming more difficult than ever to follow just everything that's going on. In fact, I typically hit the controversies in the industry like a week late now. And it's like, <laughs> dang, when did that happen? It's just like, maybe the controversy happened on Reddit, you know, Knife Club. And <laughs> I check in once or twice a week or it's something that somebody said on YouTube and it, there's just a lot of a lot of chatter and it's great chatter but it's hard to follow all of it all the time sure well if we create a controversy tonight you'll be the first one to know about it yeah perfect <laughs> i will create it <laughs> no let's, let's avoid that let's, let's let's be nice to you for one <laughs> what else do you have dave do you have anything sure um Here's one. Since you have the rare fortune of having worked in both sides of the industry, both in retail and in I don't, the companies that actually make the knives, which one do you prefer, Ben? It's a loaded um, question. It is a loaded question. You're <laughs> free, you're free to say Blade HQ, but you could maybe give us the pros and cons of each. <laughs> no, you know what? I, I think both sides of it are really fascinating. Um, that, that's a hard one. Here's here's my thought. I, one thing I loved about working at CRKT is I'm a brand guy. I love, I love the marketing and the brand building and stuff. And so I loved focusing on one brand and knowing, okay, everything I do will come back to me mm -hmm. um, by focusing on this brand. Whereas if I make a Benchmade video, you can go to 
find retailers in Georgia and buy the same knife, you know? Um, so that's one, one frustrating thing about being on the retail side. And that's why exclusives are so huge for us is when I market an exclusive, I know people are going to come and buy it from me because I can't buy it anywhere else. But if I focus on a Griptilian, shoot, you can go down to just about anywhere and yeah, buy a sure. Griptilian at this point. Um, so it's, it's pros and cons of each. And working at CRKT, it's like you kind of, I, I think in the same way, you get a little bit burnt out. Of, all right. I've seen the same model in three different variations. Like, how do I make it sexy and cool again? Whereas here, it's like, man, we've got 14,000 knives on site. What are we going to market, you know? Wow. <laughs> so it's it, pros and cons to each, I think. One thing I loved about CRKT was kind of seeing what we were talking about earlier, the, the genesis of a project. You sit in a new product development meeting and you say, that looks like a great knife. It's a great maker. They've got a great social following. Let's make that knife. And you kind of see from initial drawings and initial customs to prototypes to um, testing and all of that, kind of the whole R&D process is really fascinating to me. And I don't see as much of that here at Blade HQ, kind of not as involved. So Makes sense. Yeah. I don't know if I said one or the other, but there's pros and cons to each. That's fine. I, I'm not going to make you pick. <laughs> I think it was that was a good answer. Um, yeah, no, I think your talents are are better served in the retail side because it is much cooler seeing you cover a diversity of knives than just you know having to sell one product. Thank you. Yeah, certainly. So I have an interesting bit of 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 listener criticism that I wanted to bring up, and maybe bring it. And I wanted to have, and, and honestly, this wasn't oddly enough, Ben. It wasn't directed at you or Blade HQ. It was directed at us. <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> so, and honestly, I just want Ben to chime in on it because I'm sure they have a lot to do with this too. So, um, Anarchy underscore 84. He's actually an avid listener. He listens all the time. He's a good dude. So, this is what he commented on, on my Instagram today. During the knife maintenance episode, there was some shit talking regarding the nano oil. Curious if any of you have actually tried it. As someone who's who's used it on several knives manufactured by hosts, I think he's talking about you, Brian, of the podcast, I can definitively say it's a marked improvement over what they're currently using. Brian. Brian. F him. Then use it. That's what all what do you want me to say? Then if you think that's an improvement, use it. Yes, and he, he does have one of your mini typhoons, and he loves it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he'll never buy another so, one, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I, mean, I remember what I said about it. It sounded like the scrubbing bubbles to me. But, you know, that's all I had. That's the only opinion I had on it. Dave, have you used that stuff? I, I have not. I, I mean, no. I was just saying that I was speculating. I, yeah, I don't, I don't think, think we actually right. said we didn't think it would work. We just we actually said it better. It should work for the amount that you pay for it. I, I was very specific about feeling that it it's probably not best served on a knife. Uh, you know, the the type of mechanism and the the types of loads on on the moving parts in a folding knife are not. Indicative of, uh, of a nano oil. Yeah, indicative of, of that sort of thing compared to, you know, something like machinery or manufacturing might be. Um, but, I, you know, I've certainly handled knives that had been treated or, or whatever word you want to use with nano oil, and, and I, I wasn't able to notice a difference. But what I have not done that I should now do is is an actual, you know, back-to-back -back comparison. I, I, just, I just bought some. we got to put our money where our mouth is. I just, bought, I just bought some. I just bought some 10-weight nano oil. You bought some nano oil? Yeah. I was wondering uh, so you weren't so. listening while I was talking. You were just purchasing. You're just <laughs> shopping while I'm talking. You know what, Jake? I'll <laughs> order some too, and you can only you, we'll put it on my knives and not yours, and we'll do a back to back uh, comparison. Perfect. How's that? Sounds good. Ben, what are your thoughts on on knife maintenance products, and what are some of your favorites? I recently placed an order for nine bottles of of the EDCI nine bottles. <laughs> I bought nine bottles. You didn't uh, say that. <laughs> well, it's really. Yeah, well, I was trying to save it for this moment, and I actually asked Blade HQ to write it, draw a tombstone with the EDCI logo, EDCI solution drawn on the tombstone, and nice. you guys obliged. It was, it yes. was adorable. Yes. Um, 
good question on the knife maintenance stuff. So I bought a, a little the little bottle of uh, Tough Glide, oh, four or five years ago, and uh, it's still going strong. So I use that on my pivots. And then, um, oh, gosh, what's the guy's name over at EDCI? Uh, his last name's Rose. I Mr. Should, Rose. Yes. I'll call Mr. Rose. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, he gave me a bottle of that stuff four or five years ago, and I still use that too. So I wouldn't call myself a great ma knife maintenance man. Um, in, in fact, my philosophy at some point in time was uh, once it's dull, find a new one. <laughs> 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 and uh, anyway, so I, I typically will just throw a few drops of that, uh, that tough glide in the pivot. And uh, if it's dirty, I'll throw some of that ECI. Yeah. Uh, or no, it's Aegis Solutions. Ages Solutions. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Ages Solutions. Yep, same thing. So I'll throw some of that on the blade. But yeah, it's funny. I'll, I'll wait till they get real dirty and then I'll just swap them out. And I'll just do a, a huge knife cleaning maintenance day once they're all dirty. I was going to say, you, <laughs> you, need your own, you need your own pit crew like Levon has. Yes, yeah, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> Levon, <laughs> Levon pulls in with like 18 knives that, that need sharpening and uh, maintenance and light rebuilding. And uh, leaves twelve hours later a happy man. <laughs> that was the most exaggerated statement in the history of the universe. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Are you saying you bring less than eighteen knives with you? Oh no 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 no. That part counting. was that part wasn't exaggerated. <laughs> it was how many of them actually need sharpening. That's the real question. Oh, sharpening oh. or some sort of maintenance? Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's oh, I have some. I've got to put in a little off the record story here for everybody. So Ben, I want you to hear this. So, uh, in regards to Aegis Solutions, right? Yeah. I, um, a buddy of mine, do you know Barry Schwartz? You know, Barry oh, yeah. Random? Yeah. So, uh, we actually approached uh, Aegis Solutions, Mr. Rose. James. Um, James is his first name. James. Yes, that is his name. Uh, really, really nice guy. Uh, super nice guy. Yep. Um, we actually approached him to purchase the formula for the, the EDCI solution. So... It was an interesting uh, conversation. We're thinking, you know, how much... I mean, the guy was telling us he probably makes around for this stuff, uh, selling the stuff to various distributors and through his website. It wasn't really a big deal. Um, and we're thinking, you know, we, we would pay him like a, a sum of like for the formula and the name out of good faith, you know, because it's nothing copyrighted or, or anything like that. But he valued the company at... Hmm. So we were we were disheartened is by it, that news. Isn't the company dead though? The company that's exactly what I'm saying. Like the point is is that we could uh, and this is nothing against his character because he's a really really nice guy, seemed like someone I'd want to hang out with. But, you know, I really wanted to keep that stuff going because it was really cool. And the guy he said, oh, "I just lost interest in selling." It wasn't like uh it wasn't like it wasn't selling or anything, but it was it was a side thing for him. His father owns a chemical company. So yeah. he was having it manufactured and everything like that. But that's how much I, I respected that stuff. And I really thought it was a, a really good product. And it's a shame. I did, I'm did. i still trying to get it to, uh, to come back to life under a new banner. So, so he's, not, he's not making it anymore. No, he's not making it anymore at all. If you notice, it's, it's sold out on your website yeah. right now. Probably because you're a nine fucking bottles. To live on. <laughs> no, like, listen, I wanted to buy the four ounce bottles, but I couldn't because after our last episode, everybody else went over there and bought it. Oh shit! So the knife nuts bump is real. It totally exists because we contributed to the purchasing of all of the Aegis Knife Care Solutions products on BladeHQ.com, and then I was so annoyed that I bought nine bottles of the nine one ounce bottles of the shit. So I ended up getting two. It's split into two boxes sent to me with with tombstones drawn on them. That's funny. See, I didn't I didn't realize they were out because um, I, I knew we were having a hard time getting it because mm -hmm. we we've had it in this little add to cart feature for a minute, sold a bunch of it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I didn't realize that he kind of closed up shop. That's a bummer. So yeah. he wanted to charge you fifteen thousand dollars for it. Correct. For defunct company. Correct. Bummer, dude. Yeah. So that was that was that's that's my story about Aegis Knife Care Solutions. Maybe a company with a little bit more capital than us, maybe Blade HQ, could hmm. buy it. And don't we'll don't some, give them any ideas. Have some Blade HQ yeah. branded maintenance products. Yeah, we were well. We had already planned on making it blue. So there I you was, go. 
make it make the make the uh, bottle silver and the solution blue, and you've got I don't know BQHI or something to that. Isn't the Blade Chain logo also kind of shield like? You can keep the Aegis name. It's uh, oh yeah. All right, I'll I'll oh, take yeah. I'll take a finder's fee for that. <laughs> Anyway, in perpetuity. You guys do have the uh, microfiber cloth, right? The Blade HQ microfiber cloth. I feel like it's a natural extension yeah. of the brand. Oh, and yeah. don't That's forget the cool. socks. Don't forget the socks. Okay. Oh yeah. I want a pair of the socks. That's what I need to get myself. <laughs> Those are gone. They're gone forever. The Blade HQ. Well, we might make them again someday, but mm. we kind of do runs. You get it. Get it when it's hot, or you don't get it. <laughs> Is your wardrobe completely Blade HQ'd out right now? You know what? Yeah. It was. No. It had gotten to the point where it was like, "All right, I can't wear a knife shirt every day." <laughs> I could, but I like internally it didn't feel right anymore. And so I just bought a whole bunch of like blank t-shirts the other day, and that's what I'm wearing currently. But I probably have like 20 knife shirts in my closet. <laughs> it's like I didn't even know there were that many knife shirts to begin with. Oh yeah, oh yeah. In fact, we just we just barely put in a new order for. New Blade HQ shirt that'll go on National Knife Day. It's a cool one. I think it's one of the coolest we've made yet. I can't wait. Maybe once we get the Knife oh, yeah. Nuts what, uh, t-shirts made, we can have them distributed through Blade HQ. <laughs> Do it. Do it. Finder's fee. Ooh. Oh. I don't, I don't think the podcast generates enough revenue yet for that. <laughs> we are at a whopping zero yes. dollars. Oh, we're negative right. dollars. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> hey, well, hey, thank you, Blade HQ, for sponsoring podcasts in general. Like yeah. Podcasts, I'm yeah, seriously. Not, not saying you guys need to sponsor us because I think we have a little bit too much questionable content. But nevertheless, it was really cool <laughs> that you guys have sponsored podcasts as well. That's yeah, you, you people, know, we we jumped on with um, Everyday Commentary years and years ago, and Tony's Tony's been awesome. Uh, just just generally like teaming up with, like I said before, like being part of this industry not just in name only, but in practice is super important to us. And I think the editorial side of it has been a big win for us as well. Totally. So. Um, I think that's it for my questions from, uh, from my Instagram. Do you guys have anything else you want to talk about? Um, ben, is there anything you wanted to plug? Is there anything you wanted to talk about? Oh man, I'm like the worst <laughs> at plugging on the spot. What I will say, National Life Day is going to be fun. We got a lot of stuff coming out for that, and we we just cooked up. You know when like random weird ideas come out? Uh, that's what we got coming out for National Life Day. It'll be starting this month, August twenty second, twenty third, and twenty fourth. Uh, free T shirts, free socks. We're doing some Boker socks, some Benchmade socks. That's what I need. It's it's weird. It's totally fun and weird. But uh, yeah, so there's my plug. National Life Day will be a, a good riot over here. That sounds awesome. It'll be fun. Sounds very exciting. Yeah. Very cool. How, yeah. about, how about future product? Is there anything coming uh, coming into the uh, into the Blade HQ website that we should know about right now? Ooh. Yeah, good question. I'm trying to think what I can what I can tell you. Um, there will be, like I mentioned, a couple spider codes coming out. There's going to be a Benchmade exclusive coming up pretty soon. Um, we just launched a Boker Urban Trapper in a marble car carbon fiber. Oh, that's very nice. It's a good looking one. Yeah, it looks really good. Um, yeah. What else is coming out here quick? Those are the ones that come to mind at good? the moment. Um, but you know, people people live on our new arrival section on our website. Yeah, that's right. That's the first <laughs> place I go. <laughs> it is literally yeah. my most visited website. Yeah, late night browsing is like the mm, thing to yeah. do before you go to bed. Just like let's on check a, the Blade HQ new arrival uh, section yep. on on FaceTime what, audio, what my, preferably. Yes, one of my everybody. favorite. <laughs> one of my favorite things to do there is is pull up the Google Analytics <laughs> and just look at how many people are sitting on new arrival. Yeah, right. It's it's hilarious. Oh god! <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, it's literally my most visited website. I have it open right now. It's probably open on my iPad as we speak. Yeah. I, it's actually, you, need a, you need a cookie for that. You guys are keeping us keeping us afloat. <laughs> yeah, right. Like was that? I was talking about an actual cookie or like a web cookie. No, you need like a, a chocolate chip cookie delivered to your doorstep, hot. Oh, so I was going to say, I'm sure there's already a cookie for that in my. On my computer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, web <Yeah>. humor. Anyway, <laughs> I love it. I love it. 
<laughs> oh gosh. So yeah. Uh, so I know you can't really talk about them, but is any of them a, a happen to be a paramilitary three or a para three? Your silence. Uh, yes. I'm not gonna say. I'm not gonna say a yes or a no. I'm just gonna say we got some spider codes in the works. <laughs> Yay! I, I mean, has the para three been as popular as it was? you know heralded to be because it was definitely one of those knives that people were looking forward to for like literally like five years and um has on your end have you noticed that oh yeah yeah it's been extremely popular um definitely not as much you know i think some of these things take time to take off yeah pair pair two is like when you when you compare it to a pair of two you're like oh pair three just it's okay pair two's had this fan base for years and years at this point yeah um and so I think the Para Three is still catching momentum. It's done extremely well, though. Um, I would I would be willing to wager if you were to check it all the retailers across the industry that they've, they've seen a good Para Three bump. Yeah, well, I have a theory about this too because I think that the Para Two really took off once the collector market really started to go a little crazy, and they were like, "Wow, yeah. this is the best knife you can get." Blah blah blah, and it really is a great knife. I think the Para Three has yet to hit its stride. Because right now you're looking at the S30 V models and things like that. Once you, and now everyone knows to wait for like the exclusives, different colors and things like that. Exactly. So I think, yeah, I think we're 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 waiting on the the powder keg of Paramilitary Three or Para I Three. In fact, yeah. I, I heard just this morning. I think the Blurple version is dropping like this week or something. Yeah, the pre-orders are up. So. Are yep. somewhere maybe later. That one's. Too? S110V, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. Yep, that's yep, one yes. Yep. And then so, the, yeah, I, I would agree with you there. I think I think it will hit a stride here in the next year. Should be cool, because you got there's a Maximit coming out in a yeah. full production. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. exciting. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I got onto this Spyderco kick, but I blame Jake. And I blame <laughs> Richard. <laughs> no one knows who Richard is. Hi, Richard. Anyway. No, they should at this point, because every, every uh, podcast I mention having to send knives across the pond so he's jake's imaginary <laughs> friend yes i have i have a real knife pen pal it's actually snuffleupagus yeah. yeah i just wanted to say snuffleupagus is, is, is on snuffleupagus this british <laughs> he should be how about how about a fun one something a little bit more generic so, since you see a lot of uh, knives come and go and you've been in the industry for a while you know sometimes we talk about the difference between like fads and long-term uh I don't know styles and changes, the things that that are here to stay. A lot of collectors talk about, um, you know, like what's the word I'm looking for? I guess just tactical folders in general. The titanium frame lock as the industry standard uh, sort of replaced collectors who were, you know, looking for um, I don't know old case slip joints and things of that nature. If you had to guess for fun, what would you say is is an up and coming futuristic um popular trend. or in you know standard trend that might stick around for a while yeah good question i you talk about titanium folders and i i think they're on the wane would be my guess um i think people have i, I wouldn't say they're going away by any means but they kind of came on the scene and everybody needed them and wanted them and that's what manufacturers made but as far as trends go um I was talking to Jared Oser the other day. He's a custom maker that makes traditionals. He's here in Lehigh, Utah as well. And I was looking at some of his stuff. He's done an excellent job combining some traditional styles with modern materials. And I think just generally, um, we're going to see more. I, I think a lot of consumers are not as interested in a huge knife. Now, knife collectors, yeah, they'll buy whatever, right? You'll buy it a two pound titanium folder because it looks cool. But I think a lot of folks are just interested in a, a useful pocket knife. And I see it swinging back toward a little less in your face tactical folder and more gentleman carry. You look at the, the Benchmade Propel that's come out recently. You look at some of the smaller kind of EDC friendly knives uh, that are coming out. And I also see a, a huge opportunity with autos. Um, I think that with the switchblade, switchblade repeals happening, I think Colorado's kicks in here in a couple weeks. 
um, you just, I, I think there's a big vacuum that will happen there with the, the autos where makers are going to realize, hey, I can make an auto and sell it just about anywhere. And it's going to be a, a, a big industry segment. You look at Kershaw's launch series and it's just, it's exploded. And I, I don't know that it's stealing from ProTech per se, or mm -hmm. from Benchmade or Gerber, or these guys that have making, been making autos for years. I think it's creating a new market segment where it's a hundred dollar auto that you can really that's high quality so as far as where the industry is going i think to go a little more edc friendly and I, mm -hmm. I see a lot of autos coming on the scene i mean Very you cool. can definitely see that i mean the, the launch series has been really popular for for kershaw and for good reason this stuff's really great for the money it is. um i'm just actually just jealous because in pennsylvania it's like you could walk around with a freaking sword in your pocket. Like I can carry a cold steel Talwar, but I'm not allowed to carry an Ultra Tech. Mm -hmm. So Crazy. it's a it's a very strange world that we're living in. <laughs> My buddy did actually just get one of the Microtech uh, uh, auto stitches and he's carrying that to work every day. <laughs> I, I mean when I lived in Pennsylvania I carried a tachyon three. That's very much illegal as well. <laughs> Yeah, that's because sure. that's because that's when you were wearing a fedora. The the official kn knife nuts advice is don't get caught. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I've actually talked to some some police that's, officers around here. Yeah. I said there's nobody who's going to incriminate you for that unless you actually go and actually stab someone. So top tip from uh, Blade HQ: if you're going to carry an illegal knife, don't commit a crime. With Whoa! It. Don't don't throw Blade <laughs> HQ's name in there. That's from us. <laughs> no, that was knots. a top tip from from knife oh, nuts, not from, from Blade knife HQ. nuts. That was a knife nuts. nuts. Yeah, that, don't put well, my I, name on that. <laughs> well, to be, well, to be honest with you. I, wouldn't you advise if you're going to carry an illegal knife, don't commit a crime with it? <laughs> uh, my, my advice is check your local laws. Check your local you, laws. Once <laughs> well, well you carry it's illegal. <laughs> well played, Ben. <laughs> well done. That was, a, that was a test. You passed. Yeah, it has my PR game. Is it pretty good? Uh, it's <laughs> perfect. Excellent. The sheen. I can, it's ref, the sheen of it is I can see my reflection in it right now. It's nice. perfect. Yeah. Can I can I be the not to play into my character too much of being the hater, but boo to both of those trends. Autos. You know, you know my feelings yeah. on autos and small knives. I know your feeling feelings on committing crimes. No. My my feelings <laughs> on titanium frame locks are also well known. Mm. That how do you feel about those? That no one them? no one should disrespect the god Chris Reeve uh, oh. by disliking <laughs> titanium frame locks. Which brings me to one thing, Ben, I don't know if you were responsible for the Blade HQ shop tour of Chris Reef Knives, but that was an incredible series. Like, that was oh, thank you. such an awesome insight. Thank you. That, I that, mean, uh, do you want to hear the back? Do you want to hear the backstory? I want to hear I'm every confused? piece you can tell us about that. <laughs> oh, man. So, so my brother in law lives in Boise, and we went up uh, to visit, and I'm like, well, we're going to Boise. Maybe I could shoot with Chris Reef when I'm there. So, I just called him up. And I figured they'd probably give me an hour to two hours. So I actually did, I shot that on vacation. Um, back in the day, Blade HQ used to be a lot more gorilla. And so I kind of, I drove up there on my own dime. Um, I got paid to shoot it, obviously, kind of my hourly wage or whatever. But it wasn't like, it was just hustle, man. Just straight up hustle. So I went there and, you know, Chris Reeve kind of has this, this interesting reputation, you either love him or you hate him or you hate him and love his products or whatever. And my experience with Chris Reeve was fantastic. I mean, he, he took, I was there for about five hours. I didn't know. And it was kind of weird. It was one of those situations where you're like, all right, we've got something scheduled, but maybe they'll give me time. Maybe they won't. Um, maybe they'll let me shoot things. Maybe they won't. And I showed up and started talking to Chris and, five hours later it was like we were done and it was it was a cool experience and i don't think a lot of people get to see the inner workings of chris reeve with chris reeve explaining it no. and uh he's a he's a passionate dude he's a guy that has I, I think his intense passion is what has made him chris reeve and it's also why he has defectors and and or, or detractors people that say oh this this guy's nuts but uh, man, I, I was I was blown away being there and seeing like just his attention to detail and his intensity about the whole thing. It was like, wow, this is it really made Chris Reeve come alive for me personally. Yeah. Cool thing about that. So 
at the Late Show this year, um, the Anne Reeve, uh, who runs the company now, she came to us and said, hey, would you like to do an exclusive? So kind of a, a side announcement. We have an exclusive Chris Reeve coming out here. In the next, I was going to ask um, about that exact thing. Yeah, we've got that coming out here in the next couple of months. So we're actually sending our videographer, Jamie, up there next week. He'll be at Chris Reeve again, awesome. kind of for the Chris Reeve shop tour reprise. Well, that is um, that centered is awesome. around this particular night. That's so yeah. cool. Yeah. So, and I'm excited about it. Chris. Chris Reeves is, uh, as a company, is kind of in a in a new phase. Chris has stepped out of yeah the daily operations of it, and so I'm excited to be able to tell another Chris Reeves story, where they're at now, and where they're headed, and and that sort of thing. So, I'm I'm super excited about that. They, I, I'm constantly. I, if you've ever met Anne Reeve, she, uh, what did she say last time I saw her? She's like, I'm a hugger, and she's like gives me a hug every time I see her and it's just one of those really cool relationships where we kind of scratched their backs back a few years ago and they haven't forgotten wow. and I think that's for me that's I have a lot of respect for that because I, I kind of shot that whole thing on my own dime and I kind of stuck my own neck out there and Chris Reeve as a company has always um, respected Blade HQ for the work that I did there so it's kind of cool to see the legacy that came from that. Yeah, it's one of your most viewed videos. I'm looking on YouTube now. I, it's a yeah. it's a beautifully made video. It's yeah. funny because you're you're right. He, Chris Reeve has you know earned some detractors, but his promoters are louder than ever. Mm -hmm. And mo which was yeah. funny because most of their promoters are detractors for everyone else. Yes, Dave. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, I mean, my my thoughts on Chris Reeve at this point is that he's been so overly mythologized. And over romanticized as a person that it's almost hurting the brand to other but enthusiasts. It, it's by people like you. The, I mean, yes, I do it like <laughs> you, satirically. You are your own self fulfilling prophecy. No, I do it satirically. Like I don't think one human being can change the course of a company that dramatically. Like just Ugh. his departure. But that's there's been a lot of talk. Uh, there's a big thread on Blade Forms right now with a lot of people speculating about the future of the company and you know inventing ideas about how things have changed since he left and it's all because he's been mythologized so much and i do in part to people like me referring to him as Rivas christ and whatnot so oh my God. i am definitely to blame <laughs> there but that video you know, is fantastic it's interesting just today in fact i got an email um chris reed and i've sent out a an email to uh, look like kind of their dealer network and they've kind of had some trouble with um a coating that they were trying to put out and they basically said we've got knives in all sorts of stages of production that need attention and we're not letting them out of the door until they're right and i look at that and i think man this is a company that really like you're losing profit by not letting those knives out the door but you're preserving reputation and they stand by that and i think that's it's remarkable um, kind of having seen some recalls and things go out the door from different companies around the industry over the years, it's remarkable to see a company that is more concerned about quality and maintaining that quality and the reputation that comes behind it than sending stuff out the door and getting paid for it. Um, I, it was totally fascinating to me. And I think, uh, I, I suspect that that email will probably go public here eventually um, through knife news or whoever else but it's fascinating to me to see here's a company that really really believes what they what they say and they're going to stand behind it even if it hurts their their bottom line i know a guy on this podcast that speaks his mind and and uh said, has always something to say about everything but stands behind his product and and sells pretty good stuff ryan do you have any thoughts on this situation not really <laughs> <laughs> He's so stoic. Classic Ryan no, fashion. I, I just, um... <laughs> I don't want to get myself in tr any more trouble today. I already, I already told somebody to go screw, so... Oh, but he's okay. Don't worry. He, he's not He's not offended. He knows. He's He, he likes you. No? Should, <laughs> no. Is, now a good time, is now a good time to, to remind you, Brian, that your anger is actually a, a popular uh, piece of the puzzle that is... Yeah, people, nice people love that, so... Yeah, have, yeah. I'm trying to be good. Have you have have, have you, you've done business with Blade HQ, right? Sure. Yeah, there's a bunch of sharp eye design up there. Yeah. How did that go? How how did that happen? Um. <laughs> <laughs> 
you, you, uh, you're aggravating me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he know he knows he was catching me off guard. That's why that's, he's, uh, that's he's it. It's me. I'm sorry. I couldn't help it. I, I think the first time I dealt with him was at um, Blade Show the first year, and they bought a bunch of my stuff. And um, typically. I don't deal with big dealers too much, um, or any dealers anymore, really. Um, most of what I do, you know, 99% of what I do is me right to the customer. It's true. And, so. But it's the same sort of, uh, you know, I'm just trying to draw a parallel from a big company like like Blade HQ. I mean, I'm sorry, like Chris Reeve, uh, uh, to what you do, you know. And you, 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 you take a lot of pride in what you put out there. That's why you take things a little personally, and... Chris Reeves sort of earned that sort of same reputation, probably. Yep. Uh, yeah, I mean, I dang job right. I mean, make sure it goes out right. It's you. You lose money if that comes if a knife has to come back. So what sure. that all you know, no matter what I do, I want that knife going out right the first time. Um, have I had knives come back? Maybe two or three out of about a thousand I've sold so far, or, or more. Um, you know, I could do better. It's, uh, hey Ben, can you look up on Blade HQ if anyone's ever returned a sharp by design? <laughs> 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 Let me look. Can you actually look that up? That would be amazing. Yeah, again, it, it'll take me a second. But... Oh, oh my God, this is fantastic. fantastic. That's amazing. In I'm real awesome. time. I also need to know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> and their address and their list of fears. <laughs> list uh, of allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. No, let me let me look here. That's that is fantastic. And then well, I, 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 can, I can look at I can look at the whole category. I do know <laughs> that a lot of guys um, will buy a knife from whoever you know, a dealer, and then trade my knife in for a different one later. And then you know, I I know like for example, Arizona Custom Knives. At one point, he had the same knife. I think he had that same knife sold like four or five times. What was wrong with that knife? <laughs> No, that's just how the game is. That's that's what people do. It's yeah. It's I just know. At the time, I know. At, at the time, it's when people were trading. So, could there be something wrong with it? Maybe, but no, nothing that anybody's ever said to me. You know, like that's I'm kind new. of why you'll you'll you've probably dealt with it, and I've and everybody that I that I actually talk to, I say, well, I, I'm glad you like the knife, but what don't you like about it? That's important to me, and you know, I wanna I wanna find out what the biggest things that bother them about the knives are. Um, sure. I know what it is, but I still haven't changed that one. So yeah, you've never been opposed to getting feedback. I want to put that out there. You, you take criticism well. It's, it's stupidity you can't stand. <laughs> never any shortage yeah. of that. Uh, yeah. Um, lately, it's 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 always been my same frustration as all, all as since I started this. Is I do a lot of customization or let the 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 buyer pick you know choose a lot of different customized parts of it and once i'm like once you give me the order and say go i'm i start stuff you know i have things rolling to change things up and you know i'll get a dm from them one day and then i'll get an and uh you know something else a different day and then i'll get an email from them you know it seems like the same 20 percent of people will, will change things more than once you i want to put this out there i do this to brian all the time constantly and that's why i don't like you exactly you know it's a, it, it, it's it's just part of the game i just do it he's probably just, just talking about me so if you ever done this to brian it's nothing personal you know <laughs> really. I, I talk to you enough though where it was always easy to update you know when i'm getting sure. i'm getting people making changes from all different directions you know i might be out at the time and i happen to look at it now it doesn't show me that i you know that it was viewed and you know, I talk to six other people in the meantime, it starts going down the list, and then I don't go back and update it. So what happens is I build the knife, and then the guy goes, oh, well, it was supposed to have silver silver surfaces. Okay, you know, show me that, and I'll, you know, I'm, I'll, make, I'll do it either way, but can you show me, can you tell me where that was stated, you know? It's and, like where um, they, when they ask you for, like, red anodizing. Right, oh, and <laughs> it's... It's hard to keep track of all that. So what happens is I build the knife, I tell the person their knife is ready, and it's, you know, it's, okay, now i got to take that knife apart. And you know taking apart titanium screws that are anodized, you might as well throw them away and start from scratch. <laughs> um, really, I know, I know, I get so it. It, it, it. 
it turned into a big fiasco. So, fi as a matter of fact, it's funny that you mentioned this because yesterday I sent out an email to my whole list, and I'm not just changing up all the time every time. It do from now on, from this point on, if you want to change, I'll, you're already on the list. You go back, you fill out a new form with all your new picks. I get the new form submitted to me, and you pay a new deposit, and you go to the end of the list. Seems reasonable. I can't, I, I can't keep up with it any other way. If, if I'm losing money on this, this mini typhoon deal with the amount of time I'm spending trying to keep this organized, I get every, all day, every day, I get the same crap from people. In your defense, I have seen the spreadsheet. It's terrifying. It's a pain in the ass to keep track of all that. And then, you know, you have a knife built or three quarters built and the guy's screws are colored and he, oh, can I change my screws? I want to try. Say, Come on, you, didn't, you, couldn't, you couldn't get your friggin' act together earlier and pick that out. Is it that mind blowing that you got to change the three spoke pivot? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I'm sure Ben Offense. will agree with this in a much more diplomatic way. <laughs> Any updates from you? I'm sorry. Now you get to see us in full in full flare. No, I, I love it. It, it. And you know, I think that's that's part of the reason is people get bigger. They just they start to standardize more and just say like, forget it. I'm not. This isn't a. You can have your eggs sunny side up or, or fried, and like take your pick. You know, and they start to standardize rather than taking orders on on a million different things because it gets hard. We see that too. Yeah, I mean, even with the box. The box drawings that we do, we do our best to get to all of them. Uh, that was my next question. I, was, I wasn't sure if it was really your department, but what was the weirdest request you've ever heard coming from the order department? Oh, wow, good question. Uh, there's been some weird stuff, like some weird like Chuck Norris stuff and like Pokemon yeah, stuff. Well, I mean, like... I don't know that I've ever seen like the weirdest ones. Most of those don't make it my way, but even the ones I see on the internet sometimes that people post them under the hashtag uh, BHQ drawing. It's like, where did you come up with this? And how did we draw it for you? <laughs> I, 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 when I was laid up, I, I, I had my Achilles tendon reattached and I was laid up for a really long time. And I ordered a few projects off of, of Blade HQ, including a Flytanium scale set for a PM2. For my Blade HQ exclusive M4 PM2. Nice. Famous plug. And I um, I got copper scales for it. And I wasn't able to leave. I was literally immobilized for months. And I remember asking Blade HQ to draw all the things that I couldn't do while in a cast. <laughs> <laughs> and they said on the box was it like a mural of all the things that I can't do in a cast. Awesome. It was pretty amazing. I think I, I love took it. a picture of it. It may have been all the things I could do in a cast, now that I think about it. See, I Either think, way, it was amazing like, though. Like I'm looking at I'm looking at Instagram right now. There's like hundred and sixty under the hashtag VHD drawing. And I'm like, you know, where where did all the rest of them go? I think it should be a requirement. If we draw for you, you must post because I want to see them all. I don't get to see them all before we go out the door. Well, Ben, when, there's some good ones. When you got a request from me of a picture of me and Chris Reeve holding hands on a swing set, then you'll know who that one went to. <laughs> yes, I love it. I also, love I think it. we're just going to encourage people to ask for even more ridiculous things now. So oh, we may have created a monster for you guys. I love it. I, lo I think it's hilarious. In fact. Our best two artists um, left the company uh, probably two or three months ago. So if our art has declined, um, we're training new artists right now, okay? so just I, I noticed that the gravestones were a little, uh, um, shall we say, abstract. <laughs> <laughs> we're just going to wait until Blade HQ is big enough and can hire full-time uh, order artists. Yeah, t Wouldn't that be hilarious? <laughs> have, have them look up a book on forced perspective and see what happens. <laughs> right. Ben, I, I don't want to hold you for too much time, but since we're yeah, on the seriously. topic of uh, integrity with companies, you, do you want to go for the tough question I asked earlier? Do you, wanna, do you want me to repeat that yeah, one? Okay, cool. So this was yep. the question I thought up, and I, I thought I should, I should throw something that wasn't a softball in. And my question essentially was about what you think the responsibility of retailers should be in policing the knife community 
you know, a lot of people, you know, that are particularly vocal about some companies, we won't name them, about whether retailers should be taking a stand against them for what they perceive as uh, unscrupulous practices. And, uh, you know, people sometimes do take it out on the ma- on the retailers and they say, oh, well, you shouldn't be selling these. If you're legit, you shouldn't have anything to do with these people. And, you know, what do you think Blade HQ and other retailers, where do they stand on acting as sort of a moral police force in the knife community? It's it's a hard balance. Let me give you an example from, I think it was last week. We posted a picture on Instagram of a knife with a mechanism that had been blatantly copied. And we had no idea that we had posted that. And I, I don't know what the situation was. We didn't get to the comments in time, and it sat there for a couple of days, and we got a call from a manufacturer. And they said, why are you posting that? And we're like, well, whoa, hang on, hang on. And we went back to the post, and it turns out that a manufacturer had copied a custom maker's mechanism. We had posted that manufacturer's photo on our Instagram. And there was, yeah, a lot of hate around that. And the hard thing about that, so we pulled the post. We're happy to do that. Hard thing about it, and, and this is kind of hearkening back to what I said earlier, is it is really hard to know everything that's going on in the industry. And we put a lot of good faith in manufacturers to give us specs to tell us the truth. And it's hard. I mean, you got, I think another example that is, is a good example of this and, and kind of shows you where we're at. We had an exclusive um, squid last, oh, I can't remember what it was, a CRKT squid. And we had ordered it in a titanium handle. Oh, yeah. When it got here, it was in a steel um, handle on the lock bar side. And we didn't catch it until it had gone out. And that's an easy one to catch. We, We should have caught it on our end. We should have stuck a magnet on it. It didn't feel light enough to be titanium. But we didn't catch it and it went out. And so you look at that and you say, well, where was the breakdown? The communication happened, okay, TRKT couldn't make it in a, in a black handle with titanium, so they made it stainless steel, it didn't get it communicated to us, and that stuff happens. And so was it CRKT's fault? Yes. Was it our fault as well? Sort of. Um, we do our best to rectify the situation. I think we refunded like five or 10 bucks to everybody who bought them and stuff. But at the end of the day, we're not the police force in the industry. And I, I wish that we could. We could. Uh, we carry over 400 brands. And so we put a lot of faith in those brands to tell us that this steel is actually S30V when, it's, when they say it's S30V. And this country of origin is this country of origin. And to police that for 400 different brands would be a full-time position here. And we, we simply can't do that. And so it's hard to... We try to respond to the community as as we can, um, but it's it's a hard game to play. So we kind of try to just play in that neutral ground of if we know for sure, we respond accordingly. If we don't know for sure, what do you do? You know, it's it's your word against somebody else's, and that's that's a hard game to play as a retailer. Um, so we just we do our best to be as neutral as we can. Um, and, and hope that uh, our manufacturers are straight up and straightforward with us. I think that's all you guys can do. Uh, I think it's yeah, unreasonable well to expect more from you guys. And, and you know, when we know, it's like that Instagram post. When we know it's a ripoff, a knockoff, we pull it. Um, but sometimes getting to the bottom of that on a case-by-case basis, gosh, it's it's hard. So... Yeah, every, everything we do is, is above board. But, uh, I mean, I read the forums as much as you guys do. Um, well, maybe maybe not quite as much. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're in there, we see stuff, and we, we do our best to respond to it. But at the end of the day, gosh, you got to... When doing business, there's a certain amount of trust that has to happen, and this is violated. We have to just kind of stay the course, you know? So... Absolutely. I, I think that was very well said. And I, and, and I think a lot of people, you know, it, this is the price that you pay for, for coming off as a small company when, in fact, you are a big company. You you bear the burdens of that sort of thing, too. How, how big do you think we are? Just curious. I, you're a pretty big company. I mean, I how, many, mean how, many, how many employees? I, I'm not in terms of employees, but the amount of product that you guys keep and the amount of product that you sell. 
I, I think you guys have, I would say you have like 20 or 30 employees, maybe more. Okay, sure. Yeah, that's, that's right in range. We're about 45 yeah. right now. All right, that makes sense. And you don't have to have a lot of employees to be a big company. That's true. That's true. I think in this industry, as far as call them boutique knife mm -hmm. uh, retailers, we're, we're right up there as far as some of the biggest. And everything is relative. I mean, in the small medicom of... Of, of the knife community, you're as big as they get. Exactly. But when you when you start looking at us versus Amazon or Walmart. Oh, well, yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. Bellas or whatever. But, you know, that yep. stuff, th those things implode on them, too. I mean, look at the stuff with sure. Cabela's and, uh, was it Bass Pro Shop, you know? They don't know what, they don't know what's going on at sure. all. So, it's a strange, it's a strange uh, yep. tightrope walk, I guess. It is. It really is. Are you guys concerned about Amazon? I know Spyderco is starting to distribute directly to Amazon, and that caused... I think Derek from Knife Shifts Free was on a podcast and talked a little bit about how he felt about that, but is Amazon something that's on your radar, or do you guys have a diverse enough uh, Yeah, base? I mean, they, they've been on our radar forever. Um, I, I think any retailer who doesn't have Amazon on their, re on their radar is, yeah. is not smart about their game. They're not on their game. Um, I think we have to look at it and say, Amazon is never going to send you free lunch with your order. <laughs> they just won't. Um, and that's something we, we do occasionally. We'll, we'll throw stuff in there. Amazon's never going to give you a free t-shirt. And so I, I think that's part of the reason we went so niche specific years ago is because we realized we can't be all things to all people. Amazon is all things to all people. But when you want correct specs, when you want to know um, exact weights, um, all of that, you're going to go to Blade HQ because Amazon, maybe the specs are right, maybe they're not. Um, it's it's a whole marketplace, whereas we're a niche marketplace. Mm -hmm. And does Amazon, does Amazon scare me? Sure, for sure. I mean, it's uh, I think it should scare everybody in retail. <laughs> Truth. But I also think where they're zigging, we're zagging. I mean, we we do things differently. We have people. We you're never going to see Amazon at, at Blade Show shaking hands and handing out swag, you know. And I think that's kind of where we we really excel is we care about this community in a way that Amazon's in for a buck, we're in for for the long haul with the industry. Yeah. So what you're saying is we're not going to see a Blade HQ Prime account coming out soon. <laughs> I wish, man. We we talked about doing like a. A club of sorts. It's mm. just uh, logistically, we've kind of dedicated more of our time to just making sure we have great product on the shelves for folks to buy, rather than trying to make patches for a club. Sure. We figure everyone, <laughs> everyone can be in the club. <laughs> Aw, we're all in the club. The fact that you guys take the time That's to measure right. everything is awesome. Like the handle thickness. You guys are like the first people to measure handle thickness, which is something that. I look for in knives personally, and I thought that was yep. awesome. And you guys continue to do that with like every single folder you get, which is crazy. Yep. Of course, is. Dave is coming up with the measuring question. That was be very good. I would give you that one. All right, Ben. I don't. Uh, do you have? Do you have? How much more time do you have? I don't. We don't want. I'm sorry. Story. Yeah, we. How many more questions? Yeah. No, you tell me. I think we're good. I mean, we we could we could end at, we could ask endlessly. So we could we <laughs> yeah, can wrap seriously. It up. No, we don't you, we don't shut up. Yeah. We don't shut up. No, do you, do you have another like? This is the question I've always wanted to ask. Shoot, shoot me a couple. I more. I, I do have a question, go but some of them. Uh, oh yeah, no, this one can go on the record. How uh, how annoying <laughs> was it getting people just screaming at you in YouTube comments about wrist flicking flippers back in like the 2011 <laughs> era? <laughs> Because I distinctly remember you um, getting a lot of hate for that back then. No, you know, I think the YouTube comments shaped everything I was doing back when I was doing YouTube exclusively. Um, in fact, I, I kind of missed that that feedback, and I, I feel like the YouTube comments have kind of gotten a little more, a little less useful over the years, perhaps. Um, <laughs> That's putting it lightly. Yeah, yeah. I mean. They, they used to be kind of this, this wellspring of like, here's how to improve direct from the audience. And now it's kind of like, I, I don't know, we get, we get some weird stuff in there now. But um, no, I, I loved it because it was feedback that I could take and use directly into what I was creating on a daily basis. 
And I, I look at what we do on YouTube now, and it's, it's a direct result of feedback from the industry, from people buying our stuff. Um, that's the cool thing about social is I, I feel like we put out stuff and we listen to the feedback that comes. It's a, it's a two-way street for us. I'm, I'm glad I'm glad to hear that you guys got useful comments at one point. That's a rarity on YouTube. <laughs> on my, well, on I browse very, through them. On my humble channel, I don't get any good ones. <laughs> I mean, very rarely. That's the sign of, of doing well on YouTube is if, if, the, if the first, like, 80 comments are just completely derogatory and useless. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah, you made you, it. You have to have a thick skin. It's true. Definitely. All right. Well, should should we wrap it up? That was my my big question, and then I have another one. That was that a I'll big question. Afterwards. Yeah, sure. you know what? I just remembered that because I got into knives right around that time, so I remember watching yeah. all those videos and all the people complaining about wrist flicks. Oh yeah, it's good. Good totally days. Good days. Ben, ben, also, if there's anything else you want to talk about, yes. by all means, plug away. You know, seriously. No, let me anything. Let me let me ask you guys this question: Where do you, from the consumer standpoint, see this industry going? Ooh. I th I think you hit the nail on the head when I mean that's a, it's a I see it growing but I see it growing in a different way and I and I, I so I heard what you were saying about uh, cheaper auto knives becoming very popular I agree with that and I also agree with the idea of tr the traditional styled folders with modern um, modern materials I, I'm already starting to see that trend with a lot of uh, you know boutique makers um, I struggle to call a lot of them custom makers, but some custom makers as well. Um, and I think that that's what's going to feed into the into the next uh, next generation, I should say, of uh, of knife collectors. And in my personal life, I'm seeing a lot of n people who I never thought would get into knives, whether it's through this podcast or since they know me, uh, like coworkers and stuff carrying knives. I told you, like, I had a coworker walk in with a uh, an auto stitch, and this is like the second knife he's ever bought in his entire life. His his first <laughs> knife was a Kaiser, and now he bought an auto stitch, and now he's on the list for one of Brian's uh, uh, mini typhoons. So, in that in that uh, little microchasm there, this is one guy who has bought, and he, this is this is these are people that are you know very trendy on top of that too. So, I see it getting a little bigger before the bubble bursts. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, I I don't I wouldn't say uh, I have anything I, I feel really confident in that specific, but definitely I think that the uh, manufacturing capabilities of what used to be the the cheap, uh, you know, in both price and quality overseas market, the Asian manufacturing market is now an absolute juggernaut in terms of quality as well, and I do see that affecting other industries, not just the knife industry, but um, I don't see that slowing down anytime soon. And I think that the availability of quality um, in the future is going to continue to um, sort of, as the price comes down, the quality isn't necessarily suffering anymore. It's kind of inverted itself from the way it used to be. So yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. It's been interesting to watch. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think just the expectation for fit and finish is just going to keep going mm -hmm. up and up, even almost regardless of the price range. I think a lot of that is due to the Chinese companies that have cropped up in the last four or five years. But I think across the board, everyone's going to have a really high expectation for fit and finish because yeah, that, knives that, keep getting nicer, nicer, even mm -hmm. in like the forty and fifty dollar price range. So and that that's the true. part of it that I don't think is a fad. I think that, that will continue yeah. for many many years to come. Um, Brian, on, on the custom side of it, where do you see the custom side going? You know, it's um, unfortunately the Chinese people are scaring me too. Um, you know, it seems like everybody has such a short attention span. They just want the next new thing that I think the $1,000 knives um, up in that range are going away, um, in, in, in my opinion. Um, and again, you know, most guys seem to want to that quick, I need something new. I need something new. I need something new. And you can't do that. And you know, when you're up in those price ranges, so it's, it scares me. And that's kind of why I'm 
trying to get my knives down in that lower range that can almost compete with a Chinese made knife. Um, but I think you know, you're, I think you're smart. To, I think you're smart to do that personally. It, it leaves it leaves room for value to go up. It's hard for a thousand dollar knife to uh, increase in value unless it's a unless the maker dies or it's a well sought after maker. I, I think you're smart in keeping your prices lower to to be able to have that headroom and grow. We almost sent Brian a, a bootleg of one of his knives, but we didn't <laughs> because we we thought it might actually kill him. <laughs> then his knives would go up in value. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Just like Brian Ty. It, yeah. <laughs> ben, if you don't know, we have a running joke about announcing the premature death of Brian Ty. So to yes. put that one to perspective. No way. We love Brian Ty, <laughs> but rest in peace. Yes. I love Brian Ty. Have you ever seen we, Brian Ty's shirts? He oh, he's he, he's a lunatic. I love him. He is well, great. No, yeah. so he, he has his, his knife patterns printed on material and shirts made out of them. What? He's, he's fantastic. That's so cool. Serious. No joke. That's awesome. He's, no joke. He, he's the less clay pool of the knife world. Pretty much. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> oh, man. He's awesome. Um, I was I was going to say on, on a little piggyback to the uh, to the manufacturing question. So where does that leave the idea of USA made, you know, as being a... Uh, a selling point for a knife, you know. Uh, does that does that mean that the USA the U.S. companies like uh, Kershaw and Zero Tolerance have to work that much harder to uh, make products that represent what being made in the USA actually means? And what does that actually mean? You know what I mean? <laughs> there was a lot of you know what I mean. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say I think the the definition USA made as a defining characteristic needs needs its own. Um, stand out, you know what I mean? It, it, it it's a selling point as it is, but it even that might have to step up its game a little bit. You know, there might we might need to either be more uh, someone someone might have to, might have to attack that as a marketing scheme or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I feel like really, you know, really hit it home. Using ZT as an example, I mean, their new products have been I, I would imagine selling pretty well on Blade HQ, right? Yeah, they do. Yeah, so I mean, and they, they're very well made. I. I the only one of the new crop of knives that I have is that uh, the 460, and you know, I like I like that knife a lot, and I do take some pride in the fact that it's made here. But go figure, you know. You know, I I almost think that the made in America stuff, and, and I'm a marketing guy, so it's hard to say, but sure, I almost think you just have to romance it. It there's there's a soul to American made, and it's not just. Um, not just say stamping it made in america i think there's there's the marketing that has to go around that it's it's being able to show the shop in action and and kind of the pull yourself up from the bootstrap mm -hmm. story that goes along with made in america a um, lot of bruce springsteen in that yeah yeah oh, absolutely absolutely there's there's got to be a story behind it because you can't survive on on quality alone anymore i think everything has to be quality and then what mm -hmm. it's and i think that's where story comes in and you look at a lot of custom makers do an excellent job telling their story of how it's made and where they got the materials and and that's the sort of thing that i've noticed that overseas companies they don't struggle have. with is, they don't have it is that that story you know um you can make a great product and you can slap a cool name on it and have a, a great maker on it but you can't give it a soul. You can't give it a soul. Yeah, no, and, and that totally like marketing romancing way of putting it. But uh, gosh, I I I drink the Kool Aid. I'm a Kool Aid drinker. Where it's like, if you can tell me a great story about a great product, dang it, I'm I'm gonna buy it. And it's stupid, but stories tell they they sell products. And I think when it's USA made, it's got to have a good story behind it. I have to tell you, you did that for a maker that I've had. Um, questionable uh you know and it's someone that i feel bad because he he does make a lot of his products in the u.s and i feel like he gets a bad rap for some things and sometimes he earns it i'm talking about jason browse i was talking about that video sure. that you guys did that interview from i guess it was at at blade show and it just came out recently mm -hmm. you know that yeah. that made me look at him in a completely different light and maybe it wasn't because he wasn't wearing a straight brim but 
<laughs> Overall, I, I have a lot more respect for him and his company because of that video. Yeah. No, and it, it's it's interesting because, um, yeah, I mean, every time I see Jason Browse at, at Blade Show, he's got like two. It, it's like the front of his booth is knives, and the back is like a playpen for his kids with Cheerios on the floor. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And it humanizes people in a way that it's endearing. And as humans, we love stories. And so I look at that. I, when you can tell a genuine story about a person and a product and connect them, it's it's powerful stuff. I, I don't know. I, I get jazzed about that stuff. I'm, I'm a marketing geek. And the so. Grant and Gavin Hawk video did the same thing for me. Yes, yeah, for me too. That one was really cool. Oh, That's another one. I love that video. That that video is still my favorite video I've ever shot. It I was like can't. magical. It was so cool. I so they live up this canyon, and uh, it was in the fall, kind of late fall, and uh, the leaves had all changed, and it was like golden hour when I drove up there, and it was like going back in time. And I show up at this shop where they're driving this Jeep Willis, and and there's a teepee, and it was just so weird, and it was like the time of day and everything, and it, I the thing about that project for me is I tried to capture how I felt while I was there. And every time I watch it, I'm back there and I can smell it and I can feel like the crisp air. And it's, it's really weird. It was, it was a, a really almost like spiritual project to shoot. It was, it was fascinating. I know that's my most watched blade HQ video because Mm -hmm. I show that video to everyone that asks me, why are you into knives? And then I show them that Grant and Gravin Hawk video. How, how many times did I ask you, years ago like did you watch that one yet did you watch that one yet <laughs> yeah i think we I, to, I, until he yelled at me like I, I told you i watched it already man. yeah that's true i mean i know jake loves that video too it was actually um uh when i was first getting in knives that was the first video that someone showed me uh it was actually barry barry came over yeah and uh, he was like dude you gotta watch this grant and gavin hawk video and i'm like i know who grant and gavin hawk are but why do i want to watch this video and then i watched the video and I was like, I see why I needed to watch this video. Now I need everything <laughs> that Grant and Gavin Hawk have. And then I, I, I now own one of the prototypes of the deadlock. So there you go. Nice. That's awesome. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny when I was filming that video with them. Um, so they're way into gold mining, right? Yeah. And um, so Gavin probably showed me, he showed me this um, prototype of a, a sifting machine, a sledging it, it yep. gets dirt out of the river and it pulls the gold out and throws the dirt back in the river well he he sat there and talked about it for about 40 minutes and finally i'm like gavin i'm only here for like three hours and i want to hear about your gold machine but man we got to film some knives man <laughs> and he, he was totally understanding but his eyes just like lit up he's they've got gold fever up there it's hilarious it's fantastic <laughs> well i understand that that's like their main product like they make that the gold mining equipment yeah at the time i'm, I'm not sure where they're at now but uh at the time it was just a prototype wow um but yeah you, you talk about knives and they're passionate and, and you talk about gold and they're obsessed it, it was that's really awesome fun. <laughs> great wow well this this was a fantastic conversation yeah I had a good time. I could keep going right. on and on, yeah. truthfully. But seriously, I want to be respectful of your time, Ben. You've already given us way more than we, we could have asked for. So it's No, been- thank you. My, my wife, uh, we just had a baby a month ago. Oh, my gosh. Month, congrats. Ago. Thank you. Hey, um, congratulations. Yeah, my, my wife is home with, with the kids. And so uh, I'll, I'll get skinned if I don't get home quick. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, give her our apologies, please. It I'll do it. Totally our fault. I'll do it. Gentlemen, th- thanks for having me on. I, I do appreciate the invitation. This is great. Thank you for being here. Yeah, it's been thank awesome. You. Really thank appreciate you so much. It. Thank you. you bet. All right. Now that Ben has so graciously given us time, now we can start saying the dumb shit that gets us in trouble <laughs> without having to do with them. So, Wing Ding of the Week for what is this? Episode 8? We're already at episode 8. Episode 8. Episode 8. I, I think I want to give this one to Shira Gorov. Do you guys know I, why? I knew that was. Because they sold every one of those goddamn spinners. That is correct. So people, for people who didn't know, Shirogarov <laughs> has this like "Born in Vegas" series that I, I I don't know are vaguely gambling themed knives. I'm not sure. They're usually like exclusive Sinkovich designs. Like they did a mini uh, poly, uh, mini Polichaki, which is usually a really big knife, but they did a uh, "Born in Vegas" version that was small and like a small cannabis. 
Uh, and anyway, so their new one that they came out with, you didn't. You couldn't just buy the knife. What you did was you had to buy a four hundred and forty-five dollar fucking spinner that was shaped like a roulette wheel, and it had a serial number. And they were going to spin one of them live on camera from Moscow or wherever in Russia they're from. And if your number came up, you got the opportunity to buy the knife. But oh, you had, wait, you didn't actually win the knife. No, you didn't get a fucking sheer gora for four hundred forty-five dollars. You had to. You had to spend 450 bucks in order to get a chance to the, buy the knife. These knives sell for literally like twenty, thirty thousand dollars in Russia. Like, oh, dude, like right, the crazy right, right, right. oligarchs, they pay wild money for the auction pieces. No, you got the. Then why are to we su- so? Then why are we even surprised that this thing sold? B- because what this is the peak fuckery. We've reached <laughs> peak fuckery. You are buying a four hundred and fifty dollar. Spinner when spinners aren't even cool anymore, <laughs> and, and 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 for the chance to buy a knife, and what happens if you don't? You have a four hundred fifty dollars spinner afterwards. Yeah. Oh my god! I guess that to be honest with you, you know that that spinner is going to sell for like four thousand dollars. I, I could, God, got. I hope not. I mean, it could happen. It's going to happen. Oh God! You can't you can't be surprised about this. I'm not surprised. Oh geez. This is my surprised voice. I know. But I l- let me make sure. I'm pretty sure I saw someone, yeah, that say that you do not win the knife. You ha- have to purchase it afterwards. But you know, even if they didn't, they sold what there was like thirty something of these per set, and there's seven sets. They made like a hu- over a hundred grand on on spinners alone. I mean, goddamn, capitalism is uh, is a universal thing. I guess <laughs> no one can accuse them of being communists. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! I don't know how to do it. I, you know, everyone that bought that one, good for you. Maybe, good for you. What? Yeah. What else can you say? I don't know. I just, I, it's peak fuckery for me. A four hundred fifty dollars spinner when the spinner fad is over. It's just too much for me. I give up. Brian, what are you doing the four hundred fifty dollars spinner? Yeah, that was my next thing. It's like, where's that four hundred fifty dollars spinner, bro? Yeah, <laughs> we talked about it at one point. Just, I remember. Yeah. Just make it I, a ba- two scrotums that spin it. around. I, if, like I said before, if I wanted to be a fucking toy maker, I'd go work for Santa and wear funny fucking shoes. <laughs> yeah, you guys remember the website? Dude, you already wear funny fucking shoes. <laughs> Not anymore. They were killing my feet. You guys remember the website Meat Spin? Let's make the Meat Spin yeah. spinner. It's just two dicks the that meat spin spinner. around. Yeah, yeah, the Meat Spinner. Yo, we gotta get someone to make this for us. The Meat Spinner. It's two dicks that just this, spin. This is our This is our dicktail.com. Oh my could we, god! Could Jake and I have one with flashlights attached to them? Yes. <laughs> who, <clears throat> I, it's. I wonder if we know anyone that could like CNC these. Do, do we know anyone that could like machine these out for us? The, who, dick, the meat spinners. Who would have a CNC machine? I don't know anybody. <laughs> you, you don't want to make meat spinners? If you can sell them and the price is right, I'll make them. Okay. Stop saying meat spinners. <laughs> that's that's what they're gonna be. Oh. That's the sound of them spinning. All right, and then honorary wingding of the week goes to yet another knife pimper for disappearing. Uh, Steve Ketchin of SP Catch is what he's on Instagram, Sketchin Scales. Just, Wait, what's how do you spell his last name? It's K E T C H E N. There's a thread oh. on him about on Blade Forums. <clears throat> he's had plenty of time to address why he disappeared. He has not addressed it. So, you know, fucking way she goes. To quote Trailer Park Boys, this is just how how it happens with knife pimpers. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before we throw this guy under the bus, sure. How long has it been? Uh, the last time he logged on to Blade Farms was June. This thread has been up for let's see. This person's been trying to get his knives for months now back from him or get them finished. So wait, have you had? You mentioned having a scale made by this individual, right? I did. I had one, and it was it was completely smooth, and then he just kind of disappeared. So, do you think maybe he's dead? Yeah, yeah no, why not? Yeah, he's dead. Be just... sick or hurt? Yeah, seriously. Yeah, he's dead. There we go. What happened to positive intent here? I don't know. Maybe, maybe he's dead, or maybe a loved one died. Should, should we have a lot of positive intent about, about someone who ran away pimpers? with money? No, I mean just knife pimpers in general. I, I feel like there's an expectation uh, that this kind of stuff will happen. You're right. Yeah, but I still think he might be dead. I oh, know. I take offense to the whole thing. I'm tired of just. Cu- All I hear about is how knife makers screw the guys over. And how many times I've been screwed over? Oh no, I don't doubt it. I don't think anyone. This honest. guy isn't a knife maker. Let's just yeah. put that out there. I don't. I don't think. Oh, no. 
I don't think uh, anyone is particularly innocent on both sides of the spectrum. Don't worry. Yeah, it's people. People just suck. Yes, they do. That, that's you know what? That's that's the message for our podcast. People suck. And on that bombshell. <laughs> Yeah, on that bomb show, let's go back to this um, this deal with this guy, Anarchy or whatever. Well, now, what the fuck was said? Oh, God. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he was just saying that nano oil uh, felt He likes better. nano oil. He doesn't get why you don't. That's that's all he was saying. Not, not he was even very you. respectful. Just we, you, in yeah. general. He said we didn't like it, and he does. All right, I'll let him slide this time. <laughs> You know, maybe he you likes can, you. You know you were trying. I know, I know. You were trying. I'm just fucking. You were trying to get a rise out of me ahead of time, and you know you caught me off guard. You know and it you worked, didn't it? Did it for work? 20 minutes without saying a word. You know what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, all is going according to plan. On yeah. a side note, I think that went very well. Yeah. Well, I, I will. I will retract. I will retract the uh, the wingding of the week if. Steve Catching can make good on returning these knives or finishing it or whatever. So it's a it's a no, I, fair. it's an open it's an open ended yeah. uh, wing ding. Yes, whatever that is. Shirogoro, that one's definitely sticking for me though. Yeah, well, I mean, if that's what we're gonna knock Shirogoro for, I mean, that's like the least of the. I, you say that's peak fuckery, but there's been fuckery for for quite a long time. I mean, peak fuckery basically changes every day in the in the knife industry. No, in, in Dave's world. <laughs> I mean, if people are willing to pay it, it's not Dave's fuckery. Group. It's stupid fucking people. It's market. It's doing well, yeah. It's, they're, they're doing their thing. In China. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. That's, you know, that rumor, it just keeps being perpetuated. I've never seen any evidence, I, but I, I believe it. it. That'll, <laughs> I just, that'll be just... a new level of peak, peak fuckery when we find out that that rumor is not a rumor, but it's true. Yeah, I feel like I, I've heard it so many times, and I just I have committed to believing it. I have no evidence, but mm -hmm. I just, I, I'm sold. I personally do believe it. I'll go I have no that's, reason that's to not fine. believe it. We have how no reason have, to not believe it. How long have they been made? That is a great question. <laughs> You know, because the Chinese didn't get good at what they're doing for the, until the last couple of years. Yeah, that, I think that's hey, probably the just, strongest evidence. Did you just True. snort into the microphone? Because no, that was weird. I, 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 I did one of those, like, horse things. But I don't know how to describe it. He's a <laughs> one of those horse things. <laughs> He's just doing one of those horse of things again, guys. Was it, a, was it a neigh, or was it where you get split in half getting banged by one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there's more than one man. horse thing. How many how many shock videos can we talk about in one episode that we had meat spin that we had Mr. Hands? What, what I didn't say? know what that's called. Oh yeah, Mr. Hands is the dude that died from getting banged by the oh, horse. Right. Yeah, that's, that video's been around for like thirty years. That's classic. I thought his name was I thought his name was Dave Knife Nuts Dave. I mean, yo, that <laughs> might be how I go out. Well, maybe that's how your boy yet. catch. That's how your boy catching went out, getting fucked by a horse. Damn, that's a real slander. Yeah, Horse. throw that up on the forum. See what happens. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's it's just like the Shirogorov making their knives in China. We don't have any information to disprove the horse fucking theory. So, oh my, I don't know if that's all it takes. Let me just say, Ben got out. Yeah, at a good time. Yeah, he. Yeah. We held it together really well, and then we really just fell apart. We we were really on our best behavior. I, you know, mm -hmm. you know that. That meme of the kid with the eye with the giant vein in his forehead who's just yeah. dying. Yes. Like, That's yeah. us and offensive <laughs> shit. Look at the, the vegan who hasn't talked about being vegan. For yes, we minutes. just we can't handle actually making a decent podcast where we're nice to people. God, he was so polite. We had, I mean, it was it was just a lovely experience. We could just make this the bonus episode. Yeah, but I felt like we were holding in a fart that whole time. <laughs> That is the the best way to describe that. It was, yes. it was like yeah. sort of leaking out when I was trying to implicate her in the in the integrity yeah. thing, but it was like no. <laughs> Hold it in. Oh, yeah. I'm, oh my God. I'm glad that he didn't want to steer clear of, of that altogether. I'm really glad that he was yeah, not only willing to address it, but oh. he he had like a long, well thought. So out listen. Answer. Listen, listen, you guys, you need to stop right now because all of this was in the recording. We need to keep this, and now we can't because now we're talking about the brand. You just got to blur out. You got to beep your... Yeah, I'll, I'll just, oh, I'll just Now you got to beep it again. Yeah. 
You're just okay. gonna have to. <laughs> you're just gonna have to beep out. Yeah, no, we, we didn't get the opportunity to ask about the uh, the SHOT Show video where is on the couch, like, brown bagging the knives at SHOT Show. So you, so you have to, you have to beep out to- I'm not beeping out Yeah. You have to! Ah, fuck. So the, the end of this, this podcast is just gonna be a series of beeps because we can't stop saying during- <laughs> fucking asshole, stop doing that. You're not, the, you're not the one that has to edit this fucking thing. I know. Oh. God damn it, we just ruined a great episode. Oh, I think no, we just made, made a lot of work for, little... for our editor in yeah. chief. I've, I feel like we just made this episode a lot better. I agree. It was way too like <sighs> typical consumer advice before. And this, this is what and we then, want. And then we breathed a sigh of relief out of our butts. That was the, <laughs> long, the long fart that we were holding. No, that was the horse dick, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it just oh. launched it across the room. <laughs> mm. Okay. Great stuff. All right. Great stuff back, as always. Back. All right. Should we should we wrap up for real? Okay, we should definitely yeah. wrap up for real. <laughs> yeah. Well, All it's right. not going to get better than, than beep, 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 and us laughing, so... <laughs> That's it. Thank you guys for joining us again. You guys know where to find us. This is Levon. You won't hear us talk about or 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 anymore. Fuck off. <laughs> I don't even think I after after this one. I'm not sure I want to give my information anymore. You can find you, well. You guys can find me at Metal Levon on Instagram. I'm on other things too, but never. You can find me at underscore misanthropia on Instagram, misanthropia everywhere else. Uh, and you can address your complaints to 1-800-223-9797. But truly, send us, uh, send us stuff on Instagram and to our, uh, visit our website. Yeah, that. Yes. Knifenuts.net. I've been Jake and I'm still Whiskey Pickle Jake on Instagram. And you all know me, I'm Brian. You can reach me at my new... What do you live on? My new secretary. He's going to take all my calls from That's this point fine. Out. Sure. It's <laughs> also we'll, we'll see how long it takes you to be angry. You know what we'll do? We'll have Brian wear like a pedometer or something with a heart rate monitor, and we'll just <laughs> have that live in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> People be sending me emails and shit just to watch it go up. Every every time it goes over a hundred, he has to give away a few a free night. <laughs> We're just going to live stream better, Brian having no, a heart attack. Even better, every time it goes over 100, his mic automatically unmutes. Unmutes, <laughs> so, yes. we, <laughs> so we can hear what's going on over there. That would be bad. <sighs> well, thank you, everyone, for Beautiful. listening. We'll see you in two weeks or so. Good night. Yeah, sure. Good night. Bye. <laughs>